Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the art table again today. We're back taking another look at Yukito Kishiro's Battle Angel Alita. We are going to be wrapping up the Motorball arc. This takes up pretty much the entirety of Volume 4. And uh, this is entitled Angel of Victory. And it's a very interesting title for this because there's a lot of interesting character work going on in here. But I want to start actually by glossing over many of the events that happen in here. Um, because for understanding Alita's character, there are small character moments, but they all build to one essential theme. Alita, in the previous volume, was selfishly taking over Motorball so that she could feel something. She had lost Hugo, um, her first love, not a very healthy relationship, uh, but clearly one that had a strong emotional impact on her. And she was just burying herself in Motorball for the thrill of it because she didn't want to think about Hugo's death anymore. Now she has kind of gotten fixated on Jess Shugan. We saw her first showdown with a champion in civilian bodies in the previous volume. And she has become less of a thrill seeker, and she has become more intent on overcoming Jess Shugan as a kind of landmark in her life. What's interesting in all of this is that Alita is actually behaving something like a villain. In fact, in many ways, she is the villain of this story arc. And she is the villain because she is basically taking advantage of all the other motorball players she meets so that she can satisfy her need to numb the pain of Hugo's death and later satisfy her desire to fight Jashugan. And it's not like the other motorball players have no desire to race against the best motorball player there's ever been. But really, when Alita is given the option of putting together a challenge team and racing against Jashugan, even though everybody wants a spot on that team, Alita is not really thinking of them as teammates. She's thinking of them as stepping stones on her way to challenge the champion. And in a different kind of a story, we might be encouraged to empathize and maybe even lionize Alita's behavior. But that is not the point of this story. And we're really told that by Ajakuti and by um, Tegan. Tegan is, Tegan tells us this through his behavior. Ajakuti is the one who calls Alita out on it. Um, I guess we'll get to that in a minute, though. Let's talk a little bit about the protagonist, or at least the hero of this arc. Alita is still the protagonist, but she is really, in many ways, uh, the villain of this story. The protagonist is Jess Shugan, and we get a lot of his backstory here. As I said in my previous video, um, he had an operation done on his brain that allowed him to uh, maximize his ability to sense chi. Chi is, in Kishiro's work, um, a catch-all term for a person's understanding of um, technique, of timing, of presence, of movement. Um, basically, an ability to read what an opponent is about to do, and react to it before they even begin to act. Um, you see a lot of talk about this in martial arts. They are really a strategic thing where you have to be working several moves ahead of your opponent. And of course, both uh, Jeshugan and Alita are master martial artists on top of playing the sport of motorball. So Jeshugan, in order to be the best motorball player he could... He had his brain remodeled, and he got it remodeled by Desti Nova. Let me see if I can, uh, I can find. We are, we actually see uh, Jess Shugan's discussion with Nova in this volume, and I'm I'm trying to find the page. I had it bookmarked here a second ago. Took my thumb out, which I should not have done. Okay. Is that it? Nope. What, what we really learn here is we begin to get an idea of what Nova's M.O. is. Because we've seen him since the very beginning. 
we saw him kind of playing a hand with Makaku, and now we see him again tinkering with Jishugen. And it's interesting because what Nova is doing is he is granting people's wishes. Desti Nova is something of a monkey's paw. He finds people and he gives them what they want in order to see how they will react. We will eventually hear them hear him describe this as karma. He wants people to see, he wants to give people the chance to overcome their circumstances and he wants to know what they will do with that. He wants to see how their personalities will express themselves when they are no longer bound by circumstances. He wants to allow people to live out their impulses unbridled by any obstacle. In the cosmology of Kishiro's world, Nova embodies chaos. He is the impulse. He is the drive. He is instinct, completely free from any constraints of society, of order, or of morality. And it's interesting that Nova is also from Zalem. We know this because he has the dot on his forehead, what, uh, what we hear Shimura call the doctor's mark. And Typharis, or Zalem, excuse me, is uh, the embodiment of order. That's very interesting, especially when we consider that Vector, he is the law of the scrapyard. He is the emissary of the factories. He is the one who keeps everything running and makes sure everyone stays within the rules, such as they are. He is the embodiment of order in Kishiro's world. And what I really like about this is when you think about it, you have the scrapyard and Zalem on opposite ends of a pole. They represent the extremes of the dynamic that must be balanced. And yet you have the embodiment of those forces arising from the opposing ends of the pole. Order and vector at the base, nova and chaos at the top. And that clearly, I think, is intended kind of as a hint to the the yin and the yang of um, Taoist symbology. You know, you have the... Uh, the yin on one side with a small dot in it that represents the yang and vice versa. Um, and again, this is a important bit of symbology in Kishiro's world that embodies this conflict between chaos and order, a thing which every character, at least in theory, needs to balance, although not all of them succeed. In fact, few of them succeed. In this story, the only characters that are succeeding are Jeshugen, and Doc Ito. Um, so I really like that bit of symbology. I think it was very deliberate and intentional. I think it's one of the reasons um, Vector is one of the first characters we meet. We meet him very early um, in the story, comparatively speaking. And we see his shadow um, in events as early as the first volume, just as we see... Uh, well, I guess we don't really, really get hints at him until Volume 2, uh, but we really don't get hints at Nova until Volume 2 either. So we see these big players in the structure of Kishiro's world very early on. And if you're familiar with Cameron's movie, and this is one of the last important comparisons we have to make, probably the most important comparison, though, you're probably aware that in the movie, Nova was the embodiment of Zalem. He was not the embodiment of the chaos of the scrapyard. He was an ultimate tyrant who was willing to hijack people's bodies and control them himself in order to get what he wanted. Complete opposite of the Nova in Kishiro's work, who is entirely invested in giving people unbridled agency and then seeing what they would do. Totally different characters, totally different opposition for Alita to face, and thus mandating that she develop into an entirely different character. Again, I keep telling people um, Cameron was developing an entirely different story from the character that is in these pages. And really, it's a shame because, as I've said before, it's Kishiro's Alita that I really wanted to see, 
and all of the marketing in that film really promised us we were getting Kishiro's story. I'm pretty much done with that, so I'll leave it at that. Let's talk about the challenge team. Um, Alita puts together a total of five racers to challenge, herself included. Um, so she takes the best racer in the second division, Caligula. Um, this lovely looking fellow with the serrated limbs. Um, she brings Ajakuti because Ajakuti is her bro. Um, she brings Zazie, the red wind. Um, and she brings Tegan, the super heavy. Uh, you can, this is actually a very Tegan shot right here. Uh, he's that big dome like guy. Each of these have their different strengths, strengths in terms of, uh, Tegan. Um, Caligula is a very skilled fighter, um, he, but he's also a bit of a sadist, uh, and he can be a little cruel. Um, but he is an excellent racer as well. He puts a lot of effort into winning matches. Ajakuti is a fighter. He likes fighting. Um, he enjoys the thrill of a fight on the motorball court. And uh, he has a lot of pride both as a racer and as a martial artist. Zazie is not confrontational at all. Her specialty is actually in escaping and evading. She's very good at getting around the course and keeping herself alive. And then there's Tegan. Tegan is a plotter. He's not very smart. In fact, I describe him as downright stupid. Um, he's huge. He's massive. He can't really maneuver. He's not very fast. But he's very enthusiastic. That's the only thing he has going for him. And he's going to be kind of important. Because when we get to the end of the qualifying race, and Alita puts her team together, she announces that if she beats Jashugin, she intends to quit motorball. And Ajakuti tells her, you know, everyone who goes out and races in motorball is doing it because they want to win. They want to satisfy the fans. They want to be the best motorball players they can be. And in that sense, even Tegan is a professional motorball player. But Alita, she's not. This was never about the sport, the competition, the fans, or winning. It was just something she did so she could be satisfied with where she was in life. It was incredibly selfish of her, and the fact that she's willing to throw away a potential championship, mat, uh, championship belt if she wins is a sign that none of this ever really had a lot of weight for her. Unlike... Jashugan. Jashugan, through this entire story, has been fixated not on just being a good motorball player, but on being the champion of embodying everything that is good about motorball. Um, the drive to victory, the personal excellence, and on setting a good example for his younger sister, Shimura, who he has spent a lot of his life protecting. Jashugan um, knows this is his last race. He has been, um, his brain has been failing after the the uh, remodeling operation that Nova did on it. It did make his brain very optimized for sensing chi and playing motorball, but it has also put a lot of stress on it. He's starting to flatline. He knows he's probably going to die in this race, but he was probably going to die shortly after if he didn't race. So he decides it's more important to go out doing the thing that he sacrificed everything for and leaving as much as he can to his sister. Um, so he goes out onto the ring for the final showdown. And uh, something that I was not at all expecting the first time I read it happens. Um, we see the motorball, our five man team coming out of the gate with Jashugan among them. And over the course of the next six, eight, nine pages of a 40 page chapter, uh, Jashugan wipes out the challenger team. Everybody except Alita is, is just gone, just gone. There's, there's not a whole lot of, 
epic lines or great dialogue. They don't even put up much of a fight. He just tears them apart. Jashugan is that good. And um, after watching her challenge team wiped out almost effortlessly, we see Alita go back to Mars. Mar- Alita has gone to this uh, place on Mars in some of her most intense matches. Uh, whenever she's had to uh, remember something or push herself to overcome something, um, she drags up these memories of who she was before she got to Earth. She sees her Panzer Kunstmaster, um, and he gives her some kind of wisdom. And she gets a little wisdom there, and she fights. Um, she tries to take it out, and she fights with Jashugan. But she's losing. And um, Jashugan is an incredible fighter. Uh, we see him um, take some good hits from Alita. But she manages to come back, and then, you know, after a little give and take, Jashugan looks like he's coming out on top. And then at the last moment, um, Tegan recovers. Now, Tegan was knocked out. Uh, Technically, he was disqualified uh, because he he left the course during uh, his initial brawl with Jashugan. But he was such a single-minded, focused player— Bent, hell bent on winning this motorball match and proving he was worthy to challenge the champion, that he comes back in. And this shows that Tegan has the tenacity for victory that Alita has really been lacking this whole time. Um, Alita was about ready to roll over and let Jashugan beat her on the course. And when Tegan comes out, when he shows he has that extra wind in him that he really wants and needs this motorball win, um, we see the difference between, oh, excuse me, Teagle, Teagle, not Tegan. I don't know where I got Tegan from. Um, this is the difference that Ajikuti was talking about. The difference between a pro motorball player and a casual amateur like Alita. And she rallies, um, she grieves for just a moment, um, but she rallies and she comes out against Jashugan and lays a smackdown on him. Um, this is actually the first time we see her use uh, the Panzer Kunst Herza Heonen, which is a, a really fun idea for a technique. Basically, she uh, she s- channels sound waves through s- um, cyborg support structures when she hits them. So basically, uh, just like a a mace rings the bell of a, a knight in armor when you hit them on the head. Um, same basic principle applied to, to cyber arms and using um, ultrasonic pulses generated by well-tuned cyber arms. It's a, it's a cool kind of like mix of martial arts and um, high science. And she uses it to uh, flatten Jashugan for just a moment. And we see Jashugan start to flatline again. Then he sees this little um, necklace that Shimura gave him just before the race. And something incredible happens. Um, Jashugan pulls himself up out of the wreckage of Teagle. And um, he draws himself up. We see him kind of arise as this unholy avatar almost and he steps into the plains of mars we see him confront alita and her instructor and they have one final showdown where he he just one hits her and lays her out it's a it's a really awesome exchange um and then we see alita wake up after the race and uh, we see that Jashugan was the last man standing. He won the exchange, he won the match, and he is the champion of motorball. And this is a really great ending for Jashugan because he's unbeatable now. He won the match and then he died. Or perhaps he ascended to a higher plane of existence. We did see him in the dreamscape after all. And maybe, just maybe... He reached a level of perfection 
so high that he could no longer remain uh, here in the material plane. Either way, Alita is never going to have the chance to get the satisfaction of the win. That selfish thing that she chased all the way through two volumes of this story across three divisions of motorball, wiping out four of their best players, she's never going to get the thing that she spent all that for. She's never going to get the satisfaction of beating Jashugan. It's not going to happen. He's going to be the best forever. And that's not bad. In fact, if you look at her expression on the last page of this, she actually seems kind of satisfied with that. What's most interesting about this is we haven't seen the last of Jashugan. He's a part of the Plains of Mars now, and he will come back and challenge Alita again. Because whenever she's ready to give up and give in to that selfish little voice that says, man, I wanted this so much, but maybe it's just not worth it. Jashugan is there to remind her that she has obligations beyond her petty, selfish desires. Jashugan is the ideal in the distance. If Ito is the example of the man of balance that is in Alita's life constantly, Jashugan is the ideal that she will always be chasing. And her meeting with him is far, far more important to who she is than Jeshugan would be if he was just a stepping stone for her to go someplace else to take care of some other petty piece of personal business. Um, and that is, I think, as I said before, um, what makes Jashugan's treatment in the Cameron film so disappointing to me because he was really just set up as a stepping stone for Alita on her way to Zalem, whereas here he becomes a perpetual reminder of what she should aspire to be. Very, very good stuff and mm, really, really great. Um, a great moment for a great character. Now, Alita, she's starting to come out of this, this funk where she's just been chasing um, her selfish desires. She's starting to look for that place of balance again. Um, Jashugan has reminded her of how important it is. And maybe for a little bit, she'll be happy. But we're only halfway through this story, so she's probably not going to stay that way for very long. We'll talk about that some more in the next video. In the meantime, let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit, and I'll talk to you later.